Amen. We are grateful to God tonight that he has once again allowed us to be in his presence. We are thankful that God has been so gracious to us to give us another day and God has blessed us with eternal life. So we're grateful to see all of you who are here with us tonight and we're thankful for all of you who are watching us virtually. Uh, we say thank God for the opportunity to share in the word of God tonight through our Bible study time. So tonight as we continue our Surrendered Life series, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, breaking the power of the past. Breaking the power of the past. How, how God has given us the ability, the power, the strength to break the hold that the past has on the believer. And how God has given us victory over our past and victory over those things which would uh, hold us back. Uh, in his in this new life that we have so I want to get started by reading a very familiar passage of scripture found in the book of Philippians Philippians chapter 3 and I want to read uh, verses 12 through 14 as we stand together in reverence to the word of God Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 12, says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Be seated in the presence of God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, that you have given us victory. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us new creations in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we are not bound by what has already happened, that we are victorious in what will happen. Lord, we're just gracious tonight. We're grateful that in all things that you have given us power and strength and, and you have lifted us, God out of the doldrums of life and set us in this place of peace and tranquility where we can celebrate who you are and celebrate what you have done. We thank you tonight for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his all-sufficient sacrifice and we thank you for the power of the blood that still soothes our souls and saved our lives. Father, we ask you to bless those who are in attendance, bless those who are watching, Bless those who will hear the word tonight. We pray that it will be life-changing, heart-transforming, and that someone may hear and be saved. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Let every heart say, amen. Amen. Thank God uh, for tonight. And tonight, as we said, we are talking about breaking the power of the past breaking the power of the past one thing i know one thing i've learned not only as a pastor but as a person is that everybody has a past and everybody has a story um in my call as a pastor i've heard so many stories uh, some true, some not true. Some, some people will tell you only so much. Some people will <laughs> tell you everything. Stuff you didn't even want to hear. But I've learned that everyone has a story. And what we've heard and what we've said ourselves is that there is nothing we can do about the past. What's done 
has already been done. This, this is something that I try to teach in counseling. I try to teach uh, married couples. I try to teach uh, children. I try to teach parents that, that what's done has already been done. And, and there's nothing we can do to change that. The, the question becomes, how do we move forward from what has already been done? Um, but we shouldn't be so easy to dismiss the past as though it holds no significance or has no bearing on our present life. There are some people who try to ignore their past and it still affects their presence. So Dr. Peter Scazzaro says that scripture and life teach us that an intricate, complex relationship exists between the kind of person we are today and our past. Our past is significant in that it plays an important part in who we are today. Uh, the past is the journey that got us to where we are. Good and bad, happy and sad, joy and pain. The, the past is the path that we took to get to today. If it were not for your past, you wouldn't be where you are today. Whether that was good or bad, whether that was filled with trauma and tragedy, whatever happened in the past, we got to acknowledge that that was the journey that got us to where we are now. So Dr. Rick Warren, pastor of the Saddleback Church, says that, that we are products of our past, but we don't have to be prisoners of it. That, that our path, past is the journey we took to get where we are, but we don't have to be imprisoned by what we've been through. Our past shaped us, but our past does not define us. Our past may be a reality, but it does not have to be our present truth. Meaning, what happened to you was real, what happened to you is a truth, but we don't have to keep doing it just because we've already done it. We do not have to allow it to keep happening just because we've already lived through it. We don't have to hold on to it because it has been our reality even sometimes for years. That the past is a path to get and uh, has helped us get where we are. Now we learn from it, but we don't have to live in it. Amen. We, we learn from it, but we don't have to live in it. As a matter of fact, the more you learn about your past, the more you'll learn that you can't keep living in your past. So one of the great scriptures that, that teach us how to deal, how to view, how to look at our past is Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 13 to 14. We read 12, 13, and 14, but uh, we're going to read those again. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. Verses 13 and 14, Paul writes, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. OK, so Paul says that that in order for me to live as God has purposed for me to live now, I have to forget those things which are behind and press toward the goal that lies ahead. Now, watch this. Th this word forget does not mean that I completely wipe it out of my mind because we cannot forget all the things that has happened to us in our lives. That is actually counterproductive to our spiritual maturity. 
that 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 you cannot it is literally unless a a medical something medically happens to you you cannot forget everything in your past and you should not how can you have a testimony if you forget everything amen so paul here when he uses this word forget He's not talking about forgetting in the sense of completely wiping away our mind, but he means to change your affection for it. That that you no longer care for it. You're no longer longing for it. He, He said somewhere else, he said that I count it all as a loss for the excellency of knowing Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying here, I don't have the same affinity, the same affection, the same longing, the same desire for the things of the past like I used to. But notice he didn't say, I forget the bad things. He said, I forget all those things, good and bad. How many of you know we can get hung up on good stuff too? Amen. How, we, we, we can get hung up on bad stuff and we can get hung up on good stuff and miss the blessing of the right now because we're so focused on what's already happened. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But Dr. Tony Evans says this. Dr. Evans says it's not that you don't remember the past. It's that you don't allow the past to be a controlling factor in your life. It's not that you don't remember the past. I remember what happened to me in my past, but I'm not going to let that control me now or dictate or determine my future. Amen. But we cannot ignore the fact that the past is powerful. It, it's, it's a magnetic force that, that in, in its natural sense wants to pull us backwards while we've been spiritually inspired to progressively move forward. The, the past is like a big magnet that only wants to pull you backwards, only wants to pull, it, it, it only wants to stop your forward progression. It always wants to bring up old stuff. Y'all know we're, we are, we are pre, predisposed to bring up old stuff. You don't believe me? Get in an argument with somebody and see if you won't start bringing up stuff. You, you, you don't even argue about what's going on right now. You start bringing up old stuff. There, there is this constant longing for yesterday, the fond nostalgia for a time gone by. We we often reflect on the good old days, but rarely do we look forward with the possibilities of the good new days. Have y'all ever noticed that? That we're always talking about the good old days, but we ain't talking about the good new days? How we always have uh, uh, trepidation and apprehension and, 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 and anxiety about the new days. Oh, man, back in the day, we had a good time. Oh, but these days today, oh, Lord. We always think of the past as being better than the future. And we wonder why God can't bless our future because we're spending too much time looking backwards. If we were in Sodom and Gomorrah, all of us would be pillars of salt. Y'all going to get that on the way home. But Paul said, listen, I've forgotten what's behind me because I'm too busy pressing toward what God has in front of me. Here's our problem. We don't know what God has in front of us. Because we don't know what God has in front of us, we keep looking behind us for what we think we've lost. What we think was better back then. I was talking to my mother today and we of course was talking about her grandkids because that's all she talks about when she calls me, how are my grandkids? And she goes down the line and asks me about each 
and every one of them. And, and we were talking about um, them leaving home and and she said, and you know, I told her, I said, you know, I'm ready for, for my, my, my boys to go ahead and leave home. And she's like, you don't, you don't mean that you're going to miss them when you leave? I said, no, I'm not. I love my kids. I do. But I'm not going to miss them when they get out. I am looking forward. I, I've already had. They've been in my house long enough. I, I've, I've lived that life. Great. I love them. Now it's time for a different life. I'm looking forward. I'm looking ahead for a time when it's just me and my wife to where we can enjoy it. It doesn't mean I don't love my kids. It just means that I'm looking for something new now. And there's so many people who are stuck believing that the past is all there is, that they can't look forward to what God is about to do. The, power, the, the past has power over them. We, we've been programmed to believe that all that is good is behind us. And all that is behind me is all that I'll ever be. We've been conditioned to think that, that, that my past is all that I can ever be. And, and so I'm staying there, I'm stuck there because I'm thinking that's all I can ever do or be. We, we are conditioned to look to the future with apprehension and look to the past with trepidation, with, with, I mean, with enjoyment. Here's why. You know why we're conditioned that way? Because Satan knows we can't go backwards. He knows that we have to go forward, but if he can keep me unhappy about where God is taking me, I'll be unhappy with God. It's the same thing he did with Adam and Eve. He made them think that God was keeping them from something or keeping something from them. And when you move forward from your past, Satan speaks into your ear as though God is making you lose something. Y'all with me? So, so Paul says that, that we have to break our natural inclination to always look behind us and gain a spiritual, uh, a spiritual inspiration to look forward to what God has for us. Um, First Kings chapter nineteen. The prophet Elijah was on the run from. King Ahab, Queen Jezebel, he was running from his life. He, and in this moment of despair, he thought that his best days were behind him. Now, here's the great, this is a crazy thing. He had just performed an awesome miracle on Mount Carmel. He had just done this great thing that God showed up and he performed this miracle. And yet, here he is thinking that the best was behind him. Look what he said in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. He said, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father." You see what he did? In his moment of despair, he told God, I'm ready to die because I'm no better than those who are in my past. I'm just like my ancestors. I'm just like my father. I'm just like my parents. I'm just like my family. I'm no better than anybody else. Paul, I mean, Elijah was speaking out of desperation and comparing himself to his own past. Because things didn't work out the way he thought they should have worked out, he said, I'm no better than my past. How many of you start blaming your past when things don't work the way you think they should work? How many of us start looking backwards when things don't turn out like we think they should turn out, that, that we start blaming the past 
for our current situation. Y'all with me? The every whenever something doesn't work now, it's gotta be because of something from way back then. Let me let me share this with somebody and we're going to move on real quick. God has forgiven your sin. Stop bringing up what God has forgiven. I know y'all don't like that. Amen. Um in a moment of discouragement, Elijah's first natural inclination was to create an excuse about the present based on the past. Y'all read me? Um, some of us have adopted this backwards mentality. <laughs> what's, what's the backwards mentality? We tie everything that happens today to something yesterday. We don't consider how our present choices have contributed to present problems. See, we, that, that's, that's what we don't want to admit. We don't want to admit that what's happening to me today ain't because of yesterday, it's because of the choices I made today. This didn't have anything, what, what happened to Elijah didn't have anything to do with his fathers. What happened to Elijah was because Elijah chose to run. Because Elijah... Uh, accepted fear because Elijah uh, did not stand in the promise and power of God. He didn't want to admit that it's my present choices that got me where I am. He said, it's got to be something in my past that made me like this. Lord, help me today. We, we, blame, we blame generational curses. Oh, Lord, I'm about to get in trouble, y'all. I'm by, I know I know somebody gonna send me a message. That's all right. Y'all y'all gonna be all right. Y'all I, I know somebody gonna say something, Deacon Craig, but that they gonna be okay. We we blame generational curses for our current disorder, cause supposedly, supposedly, a, a a generational curse is a sinful affliction that is genetically passed on from generation to generation to the degree that I'm predisposed to a particular sin. What does that mean? Uh, my granddaddy was a drunk. My daddy was a drunk. That means I have to be a drunk. Right? That, that's what a generation of curse is, right? That, that if it's happened in my past, I'm genetically predisposed to do it, and I can't even help myself because it's a part of my DNA. That's what people say, right? A am I right? So, so then if, if, if my father was no good, my grandfather was no good, that means I'm going to be an absentee father and I ain't going to be no good. I can't help what you're saying. Is I can't help it because it's just in me. That is not biblical. Like I said, I know y'all been taught that in church. Generational curses are not biblical. Amen? I do believe, however, there is one generational curse. I don't believe there are generational curses that are particular to families. I believe there is a general a uh, generational curse that is general to humanity. Y'all with me? I believe that there is one generational curse that affects everybody. That's the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. That sin is the root of all other sins. So, 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 so my sinfulness is not because of what my grandfather did. My sinfulness is because of what my first parents did, Adam and Eve. Y'all with me? Y'all understand me? So the generational curse didn't, be, didn't start with my father. It started with Adam and Eve. Then everything else, every other sin comes out of that one sin 
because that one sin produced all sin. Y'all see that? Sin didn't start in your family. Alcoholism didn't start in your family. Alcoholism started in the garden. Sexual perversion started in the garden. Sexual immorality started in the garden. Family brokenness started in the garden. Before your grandfather left your grandma, there was trouble already in the garden. Before there was murder in your family, it was murder in the first family. We just got generational curses. No, it started with Adam and Eve. It didn't start with y'all. What we suffer from is learned behavior. It's not a generational curse. We learn it because we see it. <laughs> Lord, help me here today. See, let, 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 me give, let me give you some Bible. Let me give you some Bible. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now let's just break this down real quick. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says that sin through how many men did sin in the world? One. One man. Through one man sin in the world, right? And death through sin. Y'all with me? Thus death spread to who? All men. So who spread the sin? One man. So now how is it a generational curse if one man started the sin and spread the sin? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a generational curse, but it ain't start with your family. It is not, it is not. Uh, particular to your family it's, it's sin across the board why do fa certain families suffer through certain things it's because of learned behavior y'all gonna get mad at me here's, here's, why, here's why certain families suffer through certain things because the family does not have the courage to stop the behavior because the family has not had been courageous enough to stand up to the behavior. The family has through generations accepted the behavior and nobody has taken the, the cause to stop the behavior. It ain't because it's a generation of curse. It's because we've learned it and we keep perpetuating it and nobody has the courage to say, I'm not doing that. We're not doing that no more. Let's get together and get this fixed and stop this mess. It's not a generation of curse. It's a lack, it's a lack of courage. It's a lack of discipline. It may be family trauma. It may be a family tragedy, but that does not mean that it has to perpetuate for generations. Somebody, if, if grandpa was, was, was killed 40 years ago, you mean tell me in 40 years nobody in the family has broken the power of that particular death in the family? And y'all been in church all y'all life. And nobody who been in church all these years has taken the stand to break the power of what happened all those years ago. I told y'all y'all ain't gonna like this. But we're talking about breaking the power of the past. It's, it's not a generational curse it's learned behavior that we have not taken the courage to deal with. Y'all with me? Um, the reason why it perpetuates is because we haven't been honest with the generations about what really happened. <laughs> Lord help me. 
We see, see, we rather hide it than to be honest about it. Uh, the new generation is not the only generation that's done some messed up stuff. As holy as grandma may have been in your eyes, um, grandma ain't got the same baby daddy for her, all her kids either. Oh, we don't, we don't want to talk about that. Not grandma. <gasps> Not grandma. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uncle Junior ain't got the same daddy as your mama. Y'all sitting here looking like, like watch this, watch this. I, I know I'm gonna get in trouble, but y'all gonna be all right. Y'all gonna be all right. I, I'm just talking about, I ain't talking about nobody in particular, so I don't want nobody to send me no message. Um, grandma raised hell in the streets for the first 40 years of her life. That, see, we don't want to talk about that. She did all she did for the first 40 years in her life. Wasn't in nobody's church, was at the speakeasy, at the juke joint. She did it all. And raised her kids in that. And then when she turned 40, something happened and she got saved. Now, all you know is to save grandma. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's God. That's how God works. That's all you know to save grandma. But her kids grew up in an environment when she wasn't saved. And now grandma's sitting in church being judgmental about kids she raised and wondering why they raising all this hell. Because they spent time in the house with you when you wasn't saved. Oh, man, see, we don't want to talk about that in God's house. And now grandma got to raise the grandkids because the kids she raised, she didn't raise them right. And the grandkids are looking at the kids like, how could y'all treat mama like that? Why could you do mama like that? Because of how mama treated us. But nobody in the family wants to be honest so we can break this family, this repeated learned behavior. We just want to blame it on generational curses. No, grandma don't want to be honest about what she did. The kids don't want to be honest about what they did. So the grandkids are destined to repeat a history they don't even know. So we got to be honest about this stuff. Am I right? If we're going to break the power of the past, we need to start being honest about the past. I know you saved now, but you ain't always been saved. You need to be honest with these kids to let them know what you've done. So that they'll know I truly understand. I'm not just saying this to stop you and from being happy. I truly understand because, baby, I've been there. I done slept with folks I shouldn't have slept with. I done drank stuff I shouldn't have drank. I done snorted stuff I shouldn't have snorted. I done smoked stuff I shouldn't have smoked. I done been with people I shouldn't have been with. I've done it, so my job now is to help you to do it better. But I can't help you if I ain't willing to be honest about it. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has broken every curse. We are no longer bound to, to or by anything in our past if we surrendered our lives to God and accept Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen. So, so even the curse of that was put upon us in the garden has been done away with. Now watch, I, I want to I show you something. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, 
having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might be might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we may receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. If Christ has redeemed us from the curse, how can we still be experiencing generational curses? Are y'all with me? Stop claiming stuff just because you heard it and it sounds like what you want to believe. Galatians says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. If Christ has redeemed me and he has become the curse for me and he's the all-sufficient sacrifice of God, how can I be cursed if I ain't no longer cursed? I, I was telling Sister Janet the other day, uh, I overpaid on my water bill a couple of months ago. It was unusually high. I went ahead and paid it. Uh, come to find out they had done some calculating error, errors and and they had to credit me on subsequent bills. I ain't paid water bill in, in a couple of months. That's how far ahead we paid. How foolish would it be of me to go to the water company and insist on paying them money when it's already been paid? Why then do we keep trying to accept a curse we've already been redeemed from? And watch this. It goes further than that. It goes further than that. Even beyond the overall curse of sin, we are free from the indiscriminate ill will of others. Meaning, we are free from the curse of the law and can't nobody else curse us either. Can't nobody put no curse on you if you saved. If you are saved, nobody can put a curse on you. Uh, go, go to Numbers, the book of Numbers, Old Testament book of Numbers. In the Old Testament book of Numbers, uh, I, I want to look at verse 20, chapter 22 first. In the book of Numbers, chapter 22, uh, Balak, a king, has called on Balaam, a, a prophet, to curse Israel. Balak called Balaam to curse Israel, God's people. Uh, Numbers chapter 22, verse 12 says, And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Y you with me? Now, in Numbers chapter 23, verse 8, this is Balaam talking to Balak, and he says, How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? Ba Balaam said, I can't curse folks that God has blessed. Y'all with me? Balaam, the prophet of God, said, I, I can't, I can't, I can't curse something, someone that God has already blessed. So then, if I'm in Christ, if I'm saved, I can't be cursed. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I wonder sometimes if we really read our Bibles. How can you read in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 that God is for us and nobody can be against us and still believe that there is somebody more powerful than God who can curse what God has blessed? If, watch this, 
if you're saved how can you believe that you are saved by God and still be under a generational curse that makes absolutely no sense to me here's my thing if you are truly saved by grace through faith you cannot be under a generational curse but if you are not saved by grace through faith through Jesus Christ you are cursed but it ain't cause of your family it's cause of sin y'all with me Junior don't keep going to jail cause of the family Junior keep going to jail cause Junior ain't saved Ray Ray don't keep getting in trouble because the family keep going in trouble. Ray Ray keep getting in trouble because Ray Ray ain't saved. Ray Ray need to be saved. There ain't no generational curse because Ray Ray's mom ain't never went to jail. Ain't none, of the, ain't none of the brothers and sisters in jail. Ray Ray need to be saved. Yeah, you know, that's a generational curse. His daddy was in jail all the time. Well, it, that, no. No. Ray Ray need, Ray Ray need to stop doing stupid stuff. A ain't nobody had enough courage to tell Ray Ray he's stupid. <laughs> he, 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 here's Ray Ray's problem. Uh, Mama, you keep going down getting Ray Ray out of jail every time so he hadn't learned his lesson. You, you keep making an excuse for him. That's why he keep going back. Every time he go to jail, mama, it's somebody else's fault, so he never thinks anything really is his fault. It's the police, or it's his baby mama, or it's his friends he run with. Now, that's why he keep going to jail, mama. It ain't causing no generational curse. It's because you have not told Ray Ray, don't you take your ignorant butt back here, back down there, or you can't come back here to live with me. Lord, help me here tonight. Ray Ray keep going to jail because you keep giving him somewhere soft to land. And he know if I go to jail, mama going to be down here putting money on my books. I'm going to be buying cookies and soup. And if I get out, I already got somewhere to stay because my room ain't changed since I've been 12 years old. Because my mama, no, 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 no. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Ray, you go to jail this time, you ain't got no, you can't come back here. Why, why see, what happens then? What happens then is now Ray Ray got to learn something new. If you've been treating them the same way since they were 12 and now they're 52, what do you think going to happen? So Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the curse and we can no longer be cursed because we are blessed of God. We are saved from sin. We are redeemed from any curse or any ill will anybody can give to us because we are in Christ Jesus. So now, here's the question, and we're going to go through this, uh, and then we're going to be done. How do we break the power of the past to move forward in God's purpose and plan for our lives. Here's the first thing. You got to acknowledge how the past impacts our lives. We got to acknowledge how the past impacts our lives. Uh, we cannot ignore the profound impact the past has on our lives. Acknowledging behaviors and patterns does not mean that we must repeat them, but we acknowledge them to correct them. If we don't acknowledge the sins, the hurts, the traumas, the abuse of the past, it becomes cancerous and infects every aspect of our lives. In all his ministry, Paul acknowledged his past and used it as a ministry tool to help others. Even the great Paul who wrote forgetting those things in my past always talked about his past. That's why we know that he didn't mean to completely wipe it out of his memory. Look, look uh, 
I'm gonna look at these, but but you look at them when uh, you have time. Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, verse 4. Said, Paul says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Also, the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul said, I was a persecutor of the church and throughout his whole ministry, when he was ministering to others, bringing them into Christ, he would tell them what he used to be. He didn't try to hide his past. In fact, when, when, when Ananias was told to go pray for a newly converted Paul, he said, is this not the one who persecuted the church? Paul didn't try to hide his past. He acknowledged his past and used it as a springboard for ministry. You don't get over your past by, by, by ignoring it or acting like it didn't happen or acting like it didn't hurt or acting like it, they didn't do it to you. No, no. We have to learn how to acknowledge our past in a healthy, safe way and environment. That may mean you need some counseling. That may mean you need to go talk to somebody. There may be some trauma in your past that, that you really need to express in order to acknowledge what happened to you. And, and for those of you who are listening, those who are watching, I'm a counselor. You can come talk to your pastor. I guarantee you, whatever you tell me ain't going no further. It, 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 it makes my wife laugh when people come up to her and say, well, I know your husband told you what's going on with me. She's like, no, he didn't. Because I don't. Because you need a safe place to come and tell somebody this is what happened to me. Don't ignore what happened to you. Acknowledge it so we can start to heal from it. Some of us still have gaping wounds open from 50 years ago. And we wonder why our lives are infected, why our lives are tainted, because we never healed that wound. We never gained that forgiveness. We never gave that forgiveness we never got through or got over that trauma and so it's a gaping wound that every once in a while rears its ugly head and affects our even today you got people that are married and they don't know why they argue over certain stuff they don't know why they argue about the tupperware being stacked in a certain way it's because they may have been. <laughs> there may be some, some trauma attached to that. I ain't talking about nobody in particular. I'm just, I'm just talking. Listen, if you as a child got beat every time something wasn't stacked right, now that you're an adult, you still may carry that with you. You may still have in the back of your mind, if I don't do this right, I'm going to be in trouble. Grown folks still traumatized by what happened to them because they don't acknowledge, hey, I went through this. I've been through this. I've seen this. I've felt this. I've experienced this. So we acknowledge how the past impacts our lives, but then we recognize that you've been born again into a new family. You recognize that we've been born again into a new family. Acknowledging my past does not mean that I'm relegated to live in my past. Y'all with me? It doesn't mean I have to live there. If I'm saved, 
I now realize that I'm a new person in a new family with a new life. That, that what I've lived through was real, may have been traumatizing, may have been evil, may have been wicked, but I'm not living in that anymore because, watch this, I've been born again. And when I'm born again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, I'm a new creature. I'm a new creation. So whatever was in my past no longer has power or dominion over me, even though it's a reality from my past. I hate to think sometimes that my wife had boyfriends before we met. I didn't have nothing before we met. She's my one and only. I kind of just sit there and look at her sometimes like, I can't believe you did me like that. Like you didn't wait on me. But here's the good news. It doesn't matter about that. Why? Because when we got married, we entered into a covenant relationship that wiped out everything. Y'all with me? You got to realize, realize, you got to recognize that while I acknowledge that I have a past, I now recognize my past no longer has me because I'm in something new. The worst thing you can do if you're in something new is keep bringing up something old. Are y'all with me? So, so, so how, how, how do I acknowledge the past and recognize um, that I'm new at the same time? Here it is. Acknowledging my past is confessing what happened to me. You know what confession is? Confession is saying the same thing about something that God did. So, so when I acknowledge my past, I confess it to God, meaning I tell God and I speak about it in the same way God sees it. And you know how God sees it? As it's gone. So he says, that's your reality. It happened. But you need to see it like I see it. It can't hinder your future. It can't stop your promises. It can't stop the power in your life. It can't stop my purpose. So even though that happened, it can't do anything to stop what I'm doing in your now and in your not yet. So you got to be able to recognize that I'm in a new family now. I, I, I got a new life. I have a new destiny. I have a new eternity. And I'm free to live in my new present. Y'all, oh Lord, thank you, Jesus. I'm not constrained by cultural stereotypes, family expectation, stifling tradition, or personal trauma. I have been born again into a new family with new expectation and new beliefs. Once again, I can't be generationally cursed if I got a new generation. If I got a new family. The, the moment, if, if there is a generational curse, the moment I got saved and was born again, that cut out the curse. Because I'm no longer in that family, I'm now in a new family. I, I believe, I believe that even many believers don't understand their newness. I believe that. I, I believe that there are too many uh, believers, Jonathan, who don't understand their newness who don't understand what it truly means to live this new life. They don't really understand what it means to live in this new, free, liberated life with Jesus Christ. They just so stuck and dedicated to their yesterday that they can't enjoy their own freedom. Some people think salvation is spiritual probation. You know what probation is? I'm not in jail anymore, but I still got somebody watching me. And I can't do much because I got this on my I got this monitor on my leg 
and, and I got to keep going and checking in and, and, and making sure I'm doing right. Because if, if I don't do right, they're going to put me back in jail. So many people treat salvation like spiritual probation. Thinking they got to check in on God and, and, and God is watching them and God is just ready to put them back in spiritual jail every time they fail. No, we don't have spiritual probation. We have spiritual exoneration. <laughs> you know what exoneration is, don't you? Exoneration means I get free and they wipe the books as though I never did it before. So we're not on spiritual probation. We're on spiritual exoneration. We have been exonerated from our past. We have been free. We have been given liberty. And now we need to learn how to walk in this freedom. That's the third thing. And we'll be done. We have to put off the sinful patterns of the past and learn the new patterns of life in Jesus Christ. One of my wife's and I, well, one of my favorite movies, she said it's my favorite movie, uh, Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank Redemption, there was a man named Brooks who spent over 50 years in jail. Brooks got out of jail. He was an old man now. Everything on the outside had changed. Brooks got a job. Brooks had somewhere to stay. But eventually, Brooks committed suicide. Because Brooks could not adapt to his newfound freedom because he had been locked up so long he didn't know how to live free. Lord, help me here today. We know how to do life the old way. We know how to do life our way. But we need to continually learn how to do life God's way. A new life comes with new responsibilities and new expectations. And we must now follow the living word and the written word. The living word is Jesus Christ. The written word is the Holy Scriptures. And we must follow them as our pattern of doing new life. We know how to do old life. But we don't know how to do new life. I don't care how long you've done it. I don't care how your family did it. We have been called to do it differently. Y'all with me? Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He didn't say renew your mind so you can do the will of your family. He didn't even say renew your mind so you can do the will of yourself. He said renew your mind so that we can do the will of God. And then in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, we are not living free of our past because we're still following the same patterns. We're still doing the same things. Now, I want to ask you today. What significant changes has happened in your life that demonstrates you're really saved? 
I said this before, and I asked this, uh, I ask it again. What have you? What do you do significantly different, other than coming to church on Sunday morning, that demonstrates that you are now living a new life? What has changed in your life over the last five years that demonstrates a significant growth in Jesus Christ? Have you made progress or have you been stagnant or have you gone backwards? What new patterns of growth have you learned that demonstrate that you're breaking the power of the past over your life? Uh, me and my youngest daughter were talking the last time we talked. And she said, you know, daddy, it's funny. <laughs> Y'all gotta know my child. She said, you know, dad, it's funny how I eat now stuff that I wouldn't eat when I was little. She said, now I eat the stuff that y'all used to beat me to try to make me eat. I said, that's cause you've grown up. Have you grown up spiritually? Are you now doing things that you didn't do in your younger Christian life? Or, have you stopped doing the things that you used to do in your younger Christian life and you don't do them anymore? There's some patterns that we need to get rid of in order to break the power of the past and learn how to learn, learn how to live these new patterns of life in Jesus Christ. If you have learned behavior that is against God, I truly believe that anything that is learned can be unlearned. I truly believe that we are free to live the new life in Christ. However, I think that we are not disciplined enough, nor are we committed enough to do what is necessary to live those lives. It's not that you don't have the power to break the past. We don't have the discipline to break the power of the past. The Bible is full of principles that teach us how to move forward in Christ. But if we never read it, and we never apply it, it will never work. Last thing, and I know we are over time. I, I was uh, under my cabinet the other day. Uh, I gotta take medicines now. Terrell, don't get old. Uh, I, I have to take medicine now, Deke. And I was under there and I was looking at all these pill bottles that I have under there. And uh, I noticed that I got some pill bottles that are old that were given to me to fix something and I never took them. Y'all ain't hearing me. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, if you take this, it will help you. But in my own ignorance, when I got home, I didn't take them. And I'm probably still suffering through some stuff now because I didn't take the medicine back then. My brothers and sisters, it's not that you have a generational curse. It's not that God does not care. And it's not that you don't have the power. You don't have the discipline. And you don't have the commitment to make that significant change that's going to affect the future of your life. So tonight, let's make that commitment to do those things that God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you for your patience as we've gone over a little bit. Thank you uh, for uh, spending time with Pastor. I got quick, two quick things that I want to put on your mind that just came up to us. Um, 
On February the 26th, that's the fourth Saturday, we normally have our master's class. We're going to still have something, but on February the 26th, instead of having our master's class, we're going to have a day and a time of prayer. Amen. We'll have more details on that coming out, but on that Saturday, instead of coming together for the master's class, we're going to come together to pray like we did before. Uh, not in the same way, but uh, just mark your calendar on February the 26th. We're going to have a day of prayer. Um, I've invited uh, Pastor Creamer and the St. John family, and we're going to invite other churches to come and pray for with us if they choose to, but we're going to have a day of prayer. That's the fourth Saturday. And then on uh, March 26th, we're going to have a day of evangelism at the St. John Church. We're going to have evangelism training on that day on March the 26th. That's the fourth Sunday of March. We're going to have evangelism training. So we have a day of prayer, a day of evangelism. Those two things that God told us to do uh, when he left the earth. Amen. So we want to make sure that we are doing what God called us to do in our work for the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the power to break the power of the past. Thank you that Jesus Christ has come to give us power over weakness, power over past hurts and past traumas, power even over our past sin. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and rising to give us victory over these things. So now, Lord, we ask that you will give us the commitment and the discipline to implement those things that we need to do to make sure that we are living the new pattern of life that has been to afforded us through Jesus Christ. Bless us now, Lord, as we leave this place. Keep all of your people safe as we travel to our final destinations. And may the peace of God surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds through christ jesus our lord in the name of jesus we pray amen amen god bless you and god keep you